To sum it all up, I would say that the Kef R3 Meta speaker at $2,200 per pair represents the best value in its class. This particular speaker is a three-way design. It features a five and a quarter inch mid-range and a one inch tweeter organized in a coaxial or concentric fashion. And it's important for me to make that note that this isn't really just a standard coaxial driver. The tweeter is actually pushed back into the throat of the mid-range driver. This speaker offers world-class neutrality, especially when you tow the speaker out about five to 10 degrees. And what I mean by that is if you listen to a speaker on axis, that means the tweeter, most of the time, at least the tweeter, is facing directly at you. And when you tow a speaker out, that means you point it more into the room and less away from you, the listener. And coaxial concentric designs generally are designed to be placed a little bit towed out because directly on axis, there's going to be some kind of diffraction elements that are just inherent in the design that are really hard to get rid of. And unless you're paying honestly, like top dollar, it's not going to be perfectly smooth. So they design them to be aligned just slightly off axis. If you don't tow the speaker out, and if you do choose to point it directly at you, what you're going to hear is a bit of a bright sound. And I'll talk about that in a second. The bass out of the speaker is pretty good. It has a different alignment than you're probably used to. Now, most speakers are going to be sealed or ported, one of the two. And in the ported alignments, they're going to hit the tuning frequency, and then they're just gonna fall off at about 24 decibels per octave. So they're gonna fall off pretty sharply. A sealed enclosure is gonna hit the tuning frequency, and it's gonna fall off at about 12 decibels per octave. So it's not gonna fall off as quickly, but generally speaking, a ported enclosure will get to a lower frequency and then fall off sharply, whereas a sealed enclosure is going to get a little bit higher to its tuning frequency and then fall off more slowly. And there are different reasons why you may want one alignment or the other, usually it's gonna depend on the room and the ability to place the speaker close to a wall. If you have to put the speaker close to a wall, usually you're gonna want a sealed enclosure. If you can pull the speaker away from the wall, then you'll want and benefit more from a ported enclosure because it's gonna get you a little bit lower without sounding too booming. This particular speaker, however, incorporates a little bit of a different design where it's kind of like a combination of the two, sealed and ported, meaning that it runs to a certain frequency and then it wants to start rolling off. But then as it rolls off, it has a little bit of a, a scoop on the bottom end that brings it back up and then it rolls off more sharply. So it's a quasi sealed ported enclosure. And you'll see what I'm talking about when I bring up the data in a little bit. Another feature about this speaker is that it has excellent directivity, which means that it spreads the reflections around in the room very evenly with the direct sound. So you don't have to necessarily sit in the perfect sweet spot all the time. But that said, when I talked about toe in versus toe out earlier, there really is a benefit to aiming this speaker slightly off axis. And so that's going to get a little bit into what I would consider the cons. Now, it's really not a big con. It's more just a, how do you best use this speaker? And in all of my reviews, I try to find the best way to use a speaker, even if the best way is still not really good. It's the best way for that particular design. And in this case, it's no different. So Aim the speaker slightly off axis, about 10 degrees is what I would recommend. I wouldn't really recommend going any further than that. But in doing that, what you'll do is you'll relax the high frequency just a little bit and enough to make the in-room response very, very neutral and smooth. In an ideal world, the speaker would go down to 20 hertz, but realistically, it's just not gonna do that. Yeah, I wish it would go down to 30 or 40 hertz solidly in the room. It doesn't quite do that, but it does get lower than other bookshelf speakers that I've listened to as of late. The Focal 906, the Polk R200, and even the Aperion that features the eight inch mid bass. Those are the three more recent speakers that I've listened to that this speaker does better in on the bass. The only thing that I really wish it would do better, I wish that the profile of that waveguide and the mid range was not so narrow, was a little bit wider, because if these speakers would get out to about plus or minus 60 degrees, you know, through the upper mid range and treble area, I would be in heaven. That's based on the number of speakers I've listened to and looking at the data that goes with it. That's where I find the most enjoyment from a speaker in terms of room involvement. But 
the good thing about this particular speaker is that when you turn it off axis to smooth out the high frequency response, you now get more width, more stereo width. So now let's look at the data. I'll kind of give you an idea for why I recommend towing the speaker out. Some of the things that I heard when the speaker is aimed directly on axis and a little bit more information about the base alignment. This is the impedance and you can see that it's a nominal about 3.2 ohm load above 80 Hertz and the minimum EPDR reaches down to 1.9 ohms. So I would recommend that you use a four ohm stable amplifier. A standard AVR probably just isn't gonna do the trick for this particular speaker. This is the frequency response on axis aimed directly at you, the listener, in red, and in black is the frequency response towed out about 10 degrees. And you can see that towed out about 10 degrees, there's a drop in this higher frequency. And you may say, well, I don't really want that. And, and I hear you, but in my listening, which I did before I even looked at measurements, before I even put the speaker on the Clipple near field scanner, which is what I use for all of my measurements to give me anechoic data, I had made a note that the speaker sounded a bit bright. And that wasn't a far cry from what I found when I looked at the data. There's a little bit of a bump in the treble there around about nine kilohertz or so, and, and it's elevated right through there. Now, that elevation in and of itself isn't really an issue, but <laughs> thanks to, which sounds odd, but thanks to the constant directivity of the tweeter and the waveguide of the mid-range, that elevation stays true as you go into the room. So that particular response stays solid throughout all the angles. What you need to do in order to knock that down and make the in-room response more neutral is to just tow the speaker out. And when I talk about in-room response, this is the example. Black is 10 degrees off axis, red is zero degrees directly on axis. And you can see again that the red shows a little bit of an elevated treble. And while that's only about one to two dB difference, it's audible. Now, if I draw a trend line through this response, you can see going through the mid-range and the upper mid-range and lower treble, that trend line matches both speakers well, but around about four kilohertz, that on-axis response in red flattens out. So that causes the speaker to sound maybe a little bit bright than it would if you towed it off axis. You can possibly remedy this by using some room treatment or some wall treatment to help absorb the high frequency reflection, but I honestly don't think I would recommend doing that. Just towing the speakers out a little bit makes the difference. Do that. This is the linearity of the speaker when positioned 10 degrees off axis. You can see the overall sensitivity is at about 86 decibels. Its F3 is at 76 hertz and its F10 is at 37 hertz. Now look at this low end bass. Ain't that funky? This is called an extended shelf bass response. This is generally done to match typical room gain. So what you wind up with in the room is a more neutral response rather than maybe a boomy response. Now this is gonna be room dependent and it's gonna be placement dependent, but it actually seems to work quite well in my room because the bass did well for all of my music down into about 50 Hertz. I didn't really have any problem with kick drums like I've had out of a lot of speakers recently. I like the bass response out of the speaker. Again, would have been great if it would have gone down to 30 Hertz or 40 Hertz. It didn't quite do that, but it was enough to capture most kick drum and most music that I enjoyed. This is the Spinorama data, and I mean, this looks really great, y'all. I pointed out a few different things here. Class leading directivity and sound power. The sound power response is really good, very neutral, if you want to call it that, quite linear. The on-axis response at 10 degrees, so the 10 degree response, is also quite linear, which we already saw. And the early reflections directivity index down here in the dash blue is also quite linear, which means that this speaker will take very well to equalization should you find that you want to change the tonality or the timbre to suit your own liking for whatever reason. This also means that in a room with multiple seats, you're going to have really good response between all the seats up until about four to five kilohertz where the high frequency is going to roll off a little bit more and that's gonna be more seat dependent. But most of your listeners, if they're sitting off axis, are probably watching a movie. So you're probably using a center channel, so it's probably not that big of a deal. But this still matters to me because I don't sit with my head in a vice. I mean, moving a few inches 
one way or the other or up and down is very common for me when I'm listening to music or if I want to lean over and get a drink or something like that. I don't sit all stoic. I just don't. It's, it's uncomfortable. I feel like I'm not even listening to music anymore. I feel like somebody's watching me and if I move, I'm going to get smacked upside the head. So I like having a speaker that has a broader horizontal response and a broader vertical response because it opens up that sweet spot. You don't have to sit in one deadlock position you're free to move a little bit around in that seating area and you're not gonna change the overall sound of that speaker. This is a horizontal radiation pattern. And I just wanted to note that this does narrow up in frequency. It's very similar to the R3 regular one. So the non-meta R3 that has been discontinued now. The radiation narrows from about plus or minus 70 degrees to about plus or minus 40 degrees from low frequency to high frequency. This is the vertical response. Zero degrees right here is your reference axis. As you go above and below that reference axis, you can go as much as plus or minus 20 degrees and even as much as plus or minus 30 degrees, and you're going to have roughly the same sound characteristic, which goes back to what I talked about earlier about sitting in a sweet spot. There really isn't a deadlocked head in a vice sweet spot with this particular speaker. You can move around. Now, I'm not saying you can get up and move three feet to the side and it's going to sound the exact same. It doesn't work like that. And stereo itself doesn't work like that. You've got level and time differences that are going to affect the sound more than just the overall timbre of the speaker itself. But within reason, if you move a few inches one way or the other or up and down, the speaker is going to sound the same. You're not going to see this kind of vertical response from a standard two-way or a standard three-way design. I've never seen a two-way or a three-way design come close to matching what a concentric speaker can do at least as long as it's a well-designed concentric speaker. And that's what we have here. Now let's talk about output capability. This is the harmonic distortion at 86 decibels. We don't cross 3% THD until about 40 Hertz. And then at 96 decibels, we cross 3% THD at about 80 Hertz. And then it dips down again and around about 50 Hertz. So this kind of tells me that you're going to start running out of steam at higher output levels. You're probably going to want to use a subwoofer unless you're sitting close to the speaker. This is the multi-tone distortion, which is a great way to tell, all right, what's it going to sound like with music? Is there going to be audible distortion? And this line that I have for 3% is usually my personal metric. So if it's above that, I'm going to say, yeah, you might want to maybe reconsider or look at other options because you might hear distortion with your music if you're listening at high output volume. This particular speaker, I don't see that. We see a couple spikes here or there, but those to me are in the noise and it's also very high resolution, so I'm not really worried about that. I'm not doing live, so. Oh, cool, thank you. Random, my kid just popped in and gave me a ring, y'all, for Father's Day. She made this out of resin. All right, so back to the review. What happens when you apply a crossover to the speaker and then play multi-tone distortion music or multi-tone signal through it? This is what happens. The distortion goes down. So I'm going to compare it again to full range and then with a limited bandpass of 80 hertz and above. It doesn't change a whole, whole, whole lot, but it does change, which indicates that, yes, using a subwoofer and a proper crossover is going to help this speaker give a little bit more dynamic range which we'll talk about now. This is the compression linearity dynamic range graphic that I provide. All these lines should be stacked up on top of each other if this is the world's most perfect speaker. It's not. It's a standard loudspeaker that's going to have its standard issues. So that means that below about 100 hertz, we start seeing wild deviations in the response profile at the highest output levels and at 96 decibels and even at 86 decibels. Now this graphic doesn't look great, but if you go back and compare it to other speakers in the same price category of the same size, roughly, you're going to find they all share something similar. And some of them are worse and some of them are a little bit better, but they're all generally in this ballpark. So this data coupled with the distortion data tell you, use a subwoofer. You want to keep the speaker from overexerting itself or running into high amounts of distortion, use a subwoofer. Otherwise, don't listen at really high volume and or listen a little bit more closely to the speaker. I mean, physically closely. In other words, if you listen to the speaker from 12 feet away and you're trying to get it to do 100 decibels, it's not going to do it. But if you're listening to the speaker from about 
maybe 10 feet away and you're listening to it on average at about 75 to 85 decibels. And every once in a while you hit a peak at around 90 something decibels, you'll be fine with the speaker. Let's talk about sealed versus ported configuration real fast. I did measurements of the speaker in sealed configuration, which is what you see in the orange graphic below and black is the ported configuration. So you can see the difference in response here that the sealed rolls off at around, let's say about hundred Hertz where the black starts to roll off at around the same frequency, but then it's got a tuning a little bit lower in the port that allows it a little bit more bass extension. Listening back and forth between the two, I preferred listening to the ported configuration. It just made more sense for me. It got lower and I wasn't using a subwoofer with this speaker when I was doing my initial testing. So ported made more sense for me, but you had the option to do either one. I'm gonna answer a couple questions that I know I'm gonna be asked. One is, should you upgrade if you own the R3 currently? I would say if you own the R3 and you're happy with it, keep it. I don't really see a reason to go out and buy the R3 meta. If you own the R3 and you're kind of on the fence, maybe there's a little bit of something you don't like about it and you don't have EQ or you just don't wanna run EQ to fix some of those little things, get the R3 meta. If you don't have the R3 right now and you're trying to say, well, the R3s are on sale at so-and-so or I can find them used for this price and it's probably like half the cost of the R3 meta, should you get the R3 meta? I'm gonna say yes, I like the R3 meta that much more. The R3 meta is a more neutral speaker. I like that it doesn't have that high frequency boost when you tow it off axis a little bit. The R3 original version sounded a little bit bright to me, even towed off slightly off axis. So the R3 meta wins out in that particular area. And note that I'm not using affiliate links to send you anywhere. I'm just giving you an honest opinion. I'm not trying to sell you on anything. It's your call to make, but that's just my opinion. If you're looking for alternatives, I'll name a few of them. The Revel M106 is an alternative at about the exact same price per pair, but its directivity is nowhere near as good as the Kef R3 Meta. The Wharfdale Linton, another favorite speaker of mine, and actually at the same price, you can get it with the stands. Much wider response, but not as neutral, and the directivity is not as good, and it's not as EQable. The Philharmonic BMR V2, very, very wide speaker. So for those of you who love a lot of room ambiance and room involvement, that's a speaker to consider, but it also doesn't have quite as good directivity and it doesn't have as good linearity as the Kef R3 Meta. The JBL HDI 1600, wider soundstage, or maybe not wider, probably close to the same soundstage radiation or horizontal radiation width. So it's gonna get you similar soundstage width in your room, but you guessed it, doesn't have as good directivity, doesn't have as good linearity. To sum it all up, I would say that the Kef R3 Meta speaker at $2,200 per pair represents the best value in its class. It has good in-room bass extension and it has excellent in-room neutrality. The Anacote response looks superb. It's probably one of the best speakers that I've seen, even aside from its price. All right, that's it for this review. I appreciate you watching this long if you made it. If you have any questions, please ask them in the comments below. If you would like to help the channel out, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner and signing up to be a patron. Another way to help is by using any of my generic affiliate links. So if you wanna buy anything from a garden hose to speakers and electronics to home goods, it doesn't really matter. Just use one of my generic affiliate links for amazon.com, audio advice, Crutchfield, Best Buy, whoever, whatever you need to buy, please consider using that affiliate link. That helps me earn a small commission. It's like 4%, but it doesn't cost you anything extra. And that would really be greatly appreciated. It helps me offset my costs here. I've got to ship a lot of stuff. I spent $100 to ship two speakers last week, and I'm going to be doing more of that this coming week. So any little bit does help, and I certainly appreciate it. I will talk to you all later in the next review. Take care. Peace.